everybody, welcome back to episode three of the Remy Review. We're streamlining some of the process here to make it a little bit more efficient. So you can see I'm, I'm wearing jeans on the lower half now. I've also got on uh, my third shirt, which is the third shirt that I have that has all the buttons still. But I was reluctant to wear this one because it's got a little bit of blue in it. And I, I don't know, you might be seeing a bank tower or something uh, in the middle of my <laughs> chest now, which maybe isn't the image that I really wanted for the show. World. This week we're going to examine talk. You've heard the phrase, talk is cheap. Well, talk is anything but cheap. Talk is, in fact, the most expensive commodity on the planet. Human beings respect talk before anything else. And the most respected talk is talk from people that we trust. And of course, when we're on a social networking site, these are our friends. So our friends start saying something, we trust it to some degree, and we'll start talking about it ourselves. Now, a lot of times, I, maybe you're different, but for me, I'll hear a big news story first on Facebook, and then I'll go look it up on the internet. And just think of how powerful that is, that your first line of information comes from talk, from a friend. It doesn't come from a news outlet, it doesn't come from your government. Yeah, boy! And just to be clear what I mean by talk, I don't want to confuse this with uh, a verbalization. It's not necessarily something that you've said with your breath. It is a communication of any sort. So if you're chatting with your friends on Facebook, I mean, you're not physically chatting, but you're, you're texting and you're talking through text. See, language, when we take it and we put it onto a piece of paper, it's still talk. It's still a conversation. We've just written it out. Now, think about that for a minute, and think about how many things have been written out that have a, a monumental impact on your life, laws of your country. At some point, a group of politicians who were elected to power, or took power, came together and said, all right, we're going to have a conversation and we're going to put it down on paper and the things that we put down from this conversation are going to hold true for the, uh, the eternity of how long our, our country is around. That people are going to keep following the things that we said in this very important conversation that's recorded on paper. But ultimately, that's all it is. It's just a conversation. And you break the laws in your country, what happens? Well, you go to a court and either you or an, uh, an attorney that you've hired is going to hold up your end of the conversation and basically try to explain how you're not guilty of the offense that's mentioned in this old lawful conversation. Yeah, Remy. The very idea of a country having borders, I mean that line in the ground that isn't physically there is maintained by talk. There's a group of people on this side of the line and there's a people on this side of the line and they've said you know what down this middle line you own that half and we own this side and you know we're gonna maintain this by talk and we'll have guards posted on the the border of this line who will talk to people who are trying to cross the line and uh, exert an authority authority still based on laws which were talk someone said something and put it on paper even within our countries, there are borders formed by talk. We've split up our countries and parceled off the land, and then we sell the land. And when you buy it, you get a deed. And this deed is, again, some talk that someone has said, this person owns this piece of land sketched out by these lines. But ultimately, that is only held up by talk. Because if the government gave you the right to purchase a parcel of land. If that government no longer exists, sorry, but your deed or whatever you want to call it doesn't mean anything anymore because the authorization to make that talk mean something no longer exists. The government that said those things, that had that talk, no longer exists to assert that that conversation persists into the future. Your deed no longer means anything if the government isn't there to back it. Yeah, yeah, tell them, man. When we get pulled over, the speed limit may be 80, but ultimately, it 
depends on the conversation with the police officer whether or not you're going to get a ticket for it. Because if you're going only 85, chances are you can talk your way out of that. But if you're going 105, you're probably going to get a ticket. And this is, this is all based on talk, because really, the, if you are going 85 and you say some things the police officer doesn't like, you probably still will get the ticket. And ultimately, even that number 80, if enough of us were unhappy about it and talking about it and saying, you know, I don't like this 80 speed limit, it should be 90, guess what? Matter of time, it's going to be 90, because politicians will hear that we're saying that and they'll start proposing it. Well, may, you know, maybe I can get elected based on this 90 kilometer speed limit. I'm going I'm to start pitching this idea and see what comes back. Even in the extreme, it's all about talk. Imagine for a minute that uh, an alien species comes from, uh, from outer space and visits us. What's the very first thing we're going to offer them? Talk. Absolutely. Talk. Before anything else. And hopefully, hopefully that's what they offer to us as well. And hopefully their talk doesn't consist of death rays or something. When you first come into being, you're a baby. What do your parents do? They teach you to talk. First they talk to you, and then they teach you to talk. And they'll teach you to read the very, the very basics and get you started with talking as early as possible. Because we all know how valuable talk is. And we know that right from childhood, we'd better have a good handle on this commodity or we're going to be in trouble. And in return, what does the baby do? Mama, mama, tries to talk back, tries to learn the words. Because the baby, before they've even said anything, understands the importance of talk and wants to join in the trading of that commodity. And ultimately, there's a lot of motivation to suppress talk, especially if you're doing something that people aren't going to like. You suppress talk and they won't come to the conclusion that they're being scammed because the conclusion's never been presented to them. I went for 30 years of my life without knowing that banks issue the currency in the world, that governments aren't issuing it, that it's private bankers issuing the currency. I took philosophy in university, I went all through high school, I lived with some really smart people over the years, and the conversation never came up. And in all my years of watching mainstream news, never, ever did I see this information anywhere. And you can just see the power of suppressing talk. Our democracy, our government, all of it is rendered pretty much invalid so long as someone else is issuing all the currency. But we don't talk about this, and most of us will go our whole lives without even hearing about it. That's whack! It's, it's completely under wraps. This is suppressed talk. People don't know about it. So people are being scammed because they're entering into trade with these lenders that is based on fraudulent terms. News fail. We're going to cover the Toronto Sun. You knew it was coming. Of course I was going to say something about the Toronto Sun in the news fail section. Last November, when the Conservative Party of Canada, after four years of denying that they broke the law in their uh, campaign over spending. And then they said, well, you know, yeah, we broke the law. Sure. We're going to pay out a fine of $52,000. It was brushed under the rug and the problem is gone. The problem has been resolved. That's and whack. now you let your government do something like this. Guess what? The same thing's going to happen again. They just paid a fine. There's no actual punishment there. Do you think $52,000 means anything, anything to the Conservative Party? No. Come on. It's like uh, what happens in finance when these people break the law. They get a little fine. They make billions of dollars over here and then they'll pay a couple hundred thousand for the fact that they broke the law and defrauded everyone. 
because ultimately there's there's something key about making sure that you release talk at the right time because certain things need to come out I mean the conservative party they broke the law it's gonna come out so they'd rather it come out on their terms and that's what they did it came out on their terms they paid a small fine and it disappeared democracy ensues what? What? probably the story that you would have got in a, a neo-left paper because they don't they're allowed to attack the conservatives already but they're not allowed to attack a fraudulent system so they'll attack the conservatives they'll call it a scandal but they won't outright say broke the law guy should be in jail that's only for that you're gonna see that on the free press I might say something like that here I mean I I believe that you break the law especially if you're the government you're the guy in charge and you broke the law damn it you should be in jail at the very least you shouldn't be in charge anymore why do we want a criminal in charge now you scale it up to the uh, respectable version of a, a neo-right publication this might be something like the National Post the National Post covered it and said the so-called scandal okay so the jury is out we don't know if it was a scandal it's a so-called scandal now of course if you ask them they would say well we're saying so-called because who you know who are we to say for sure that this was a scandal so we're just gonna call it a so-called scandal but think about that for a minute that's a manipulation right there so-called scandal means you're questioning whether or not this actually is a scandal so we're moving up to the neo-right and now we're not calling it a criminal act and we're reluctant to even call it a scandal the Toronto Sun finally getting to the Toronto Sun here the Toronto Sun didn't call it a so-called scandal they called it a so-called case so that you know they're reluctant to even say this was a case I mean the the party admitted to it and paid a fine I mean okay you don't want to call that a scandal I don't know what you want to call it but at the very least it's a damn case they were in court and they lost and it was a case so-called case Consume. okay so we're on to the consume part of the show and this time I'm gonna cover my HP printer I didn't want to bring it along because it's it's too much trouble. It's one of these 12-in-1 uh, printers does a bunch of crap that that none of it actually works properly. Now I'll cut to a little bit of footage. I took some footage at home uh, just to give you a quick look. It's always flashing a red light. It uh, it always tells me that I need to print a confirmation sheet. Every everything you print on this printer first it will print a test page test confirmation test confirmation and then it will half print the thing that you wanted so you know every once in a while I have to print out a parking pass or something to be able to park on the street in front of my house and I will print confirmation sheet confirmation sheet confirmation sheet and then half of my uh, parking permit confirmation sheet confirmation sheet confirmation sheet and red light red light red light here's the thing that gets me it came with a one-year warranty it worked beautifully for almost exactly a year and then just after the year mark as if there was a little memory a little program sitting in the memory waiting to be released that jumped out and just destroyed the system and destroyed the printer so that at the one-year mark as soon as my warranty was out I started thinking well you know maybe I should go out and buy that 12-in-1 printer because this this one's just not cutting it anymore and it prints half sheets it prints things with uh, uh, light colors it prints things with the wrong colors it's absolutely bizarre don't buy HP printers if you're gonna buy a printer don't buy it it's garbage I know there aren't a lot of options out there you probably have to buy HP now I don't even know if there are other brands anymore uh, you know are, are we living in a place where we think there's actually choice anymore with the products that we buy culture time for culture with Jim Smetchland we are going to listen to Remy Stevens today unfortunately 
wasn't enough time to get together with James to play together, although James is an excellent guitarist. But we're not going to hear that today. We're just going to hear Remy again. And he's covering a song by Shalamar from the 1970s. Make that move. The power of talk. Song like this, inspirational, really makes you want to move. Okay, so a new feature on the Remy Review. Very excited to have an interview today. Uh, we're going to look forward to some more interviews in the future. You know, I've never interviewed someone before, so maybe I'll start with someone I'm fairly comfortable with. We have a longtime friend and producer, owner of this wonderful place, Euphonic Sound, where we shoot the show. And since this week's episode was about talk, I, I thought I would ask him about vocal performances and uh, getting a good vocal recording because that's the kind of thing we do here. Uh, all right. Well, welcome, James. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, yeah, it's great, great to, to have here. you. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, hey, someone's here. Oh, great. Someone's at the door. Hey, what's up, hey, Sean? Man. All right. So, yeah, we got a whole audience now. It's exciting. We got Sean here. Studio we got audience. Christian. <laughs> oh, yeah, studio audience. This is, this is a first. All right. So, yeah, I wanted to ask you about Getting a good vocal take. What what is what are the, what are the things that people come in the first mistakes they make, and how would you you help them out? This stuff would be the same regardless of whether it was a singer or a speaker doing just um, narration or something. In, in terms of the priority of things, the the number one thing would be like control over their their voice mechanism. So uh, the big issue there is breathing. You know, there's a, there's a lot that goes into proper diaphragmatic singing and this and that, but but breathing is really 95% of it. And just for the sake of brevity, taking deeper breaths will solve 99% of the problems. Just take a deeper breath before you step up to sing or speak on, on the mic. Um, and I always use like the example of like when you're in a yoga studio and they make you do that really controlled breathing where you're you're taking in a little more air than you normally would. Like that from the kind gut. of- Yeah, from yeah, the yeah. gut, just more air overall. But isn't that tough to do though, mid 
performance? I mean, you're, it's very it's very tough. It's that's why I say um, like with the singers that we train here, it is ninety nine percent of everyone's problem is breathing. It always it comes down to breathing. Hmm. Um, it's clumsy. It's clumsy and awkward. Like the first time you learn to ride a bike or something like that. We we just as people we don't naturally breathe correctly. We breathe very shallow. Yeah, uh, that's how we do it. Breathing from your chest, right? And yeah, yeah, you got to yeah. push out your your stomach and everything. It's, it's all stuck at, in the neck and the top of the chest and, and in the face. And um, a real sign of when someone's breathing like that is when their uh, shoulders move up when they breathe. That that sh- and their their shoulders and the chest will actually move up. And that's that's a clear sign that they're they're shallow breathing in the chest, hmm. because that that part of the body should stay still. And what should happen is the stomach should inflate like a balloon. And from chest, shoulders, head, they should just stay put. Okay. You know? So the stomach needs to inflate like a balloon. You know, if you can visualize what that looks like. Yep. And then you can take a lot more air. And when you breathe like that, it's the diaphragm that's being activated. And then you're only, the next, you know, challenge is just to control the air as you expulse, as you say things. You know, don't blow all your air in your first line. Like, make sure that you um, economize the air so that you can get your whole phrase out or the next point in your performance where you've where you've pre-planned where your next breath is so mm-hmm. that's important too write out your timing lyrics. it out yeah. yeah write out your licks and do those little posture marks those mm. those breath marks uh and plan it out and rehearse it that way rehearse the breathing aspect mm. you know a lot of singers never think to do that why should i, I know how to breathe well, i don't need to rehearse breathing it's yeah. like the, the rehearsing the, the the breathing and breathing the same way every time is key to giving a consistent performance just does it make a difference to the the, the actual sonic character of the the, the voice or does oh, it, yeah yeah so it's not just a matter of fitting all your words into the breath it, it will it's it's night and day um hmm. it was really funny a few weeks ago i had a, a young rapper in the studio who was just you know full of piss and vinegar full of attitude he had that yeah. whole swagger down and i really liked him he was fun to work with but it almost sounded comical because he was you know dropping these gangsta badass rhymes but he sounded really thin and nasally. Yeah, short on breath. And yeah. That, yeah, yeah. And I, and I finally told him, you know, take deeper breaths and push it out and, uh, you know, sound more manly when you do it. You mm. know? And he did a take like that. And then we, I brought him in the control room and we compared like his first take where he sounded really nasally and whiny like that yeah. to a take where he had deep breath and sounded like, you know, it was like <laughs> amazing because he sounded awesome. You know, yeah, yeah. and he never thought he was like, wow, just like breathing would, would make a difference. And it's like, oh, yeah, breathing is it's it's almost all of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's good producing, right? I mean, uh, uh, I remember when I came into the studio yeah, at a few first, years back. a few years back, that I would sing uh, <laughs> something like this, right? You know, you, you remember what the, the old vocals were like. And, and you said, you know, uh, I had this other method, the, the practice method. And you mm. said, go with the practice method, because naturally yeah. that was just what I was doing that was more comfortable, but it sounded better, right? Yeah, I remember that with you. It's uh, Your practice method was actually what we call head voice. Okay. So, like, whenever you're speaking or singing, there's the, the, the two general aspects are happening at the same time, and they're in ratio to each other. One is chest voice, and one is head voice. Hmm. The head voice is that soft uh, voice, um, and the chest voice is where all the body comes from. So how you were singing was like you were really pushing it really, really hard and it was, it was too much chest voice. And because mm. you were hitting high falsetto notes, you needed to, I think what we ended up having you do was just reverse the ratio a bit. Make it a little softer, a little more in the head, and mm-hmm. we'll just turn the microphone up. And you know what I mean? And you're not pushing and you're not straining and it didn't sound as like sort of shrill. Like you get a shrill sound when people strain. And yeah. there should be a, there should be no straining at all. Like a, a, a public speaker, a singer, it's you're just relaxed and fluid. Yeah, you it, know, it's confidence comes through when when you're when you're comfortable with what you're doing, right? Yeah, a really key thing to understand about microphones is a proximity effect, and this is with all microphones. Um, the closer the the sound source, so in this case, the person who's singing or speaking, mm-hmm. the closer they get in proximity to the mic the more the low end of the voice gets extended. 
So a good example of that is like Howard Stern. When you hear his voice on the radio, it, he really does sound like he's thundering from the heavens or something. It's the voice of like Thor. And that's just because he's close? It's because he's right on the microphone. His lip right. is actually making physical contact with the mic. So that that is like a, a, a physical property of microphones. It's around <laughs> like between like, you know, 150 hertz to, you know, up to 350, 400 hertz. That sort of low kind of it's not sub bass but it's bass and the human voice especially male voices have a lot of that and uh, yeah you get close to a mic that end of your that of that's the end of the spectrum of your voice gets amplified so you can end up sounding you can take someone that's kind of just like a regular guy like howard stern and then you make him sound like he's james earl jones you know you were telling me yesterday because we talked about this a bit we didn't want to spoil the conversation Mm -hmm. but that uh that the pop vocals especially uh they they spend the most time, the most resources on those, the, uh, mm. that part of the song. Sort of like an all human experience, or, or we could say just an art itself. There's like a figure ground uh, dynamic that's happening. And in pop music, it's the lead vocal that's the figure, and all of the musical arrangement, that's the ground. So the figure is the focal point. It's what, what, it's what people are looking at. Okay. Um, that, yeah, because the, mu- the music all sounds the same underneath it, right? Well, so it's, it's all meant to support and to complement the, the figure, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, you know, when the guitar solo comes in and all of a sudden the configuration changes and the guitar solo becomes the figure and maybe okay. the, the vocals slip into the ground as they back up the guitar solo. But something is always figure and the rest is always ground. So I'm going to run out of uh, memory space, so... Uh... Okay, maybe, man, we'll, maybe we'll call it a day. But there is there's a part of the show. Okay. And it, James, thanks for coming. This is uh, hey, this man, is awesome to, to have you here. here at your place of business. <laughs> yeah, I'm here every day. It's, yeah. I'm glad to be here every day, though. So whatever. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, yeah, the end of the show. We got the uh, the the Remy Dominaton domination plaque, and uh, oh. so guests uh, can win a spot on this, but you have to beat me in a challenge, and. Uh, Pressed for time, I couldn't think of something interesting. So I put a bowl on the other side of the room, and we have a little bowl of sugar packets here, <laughs> and we'll, a shot each, and if you can manage to uh, get it into the bowl before me, you'll get your name on the domination plaque for eternity. All right. How so, many shots do we get, two? Shoot as many as you want, man. Oh, okay. I'm taking them all, then. <laughs> Shit. Oh, man. I'm so close. God damn it. Oh. Yeah. Uh, what happens if neither one of us gets it? Well, <laughs> if neither one of us gets it, then thanks to editing. Whoa, James, <laughs> you got it! Holy shit! And then, and then later, I'll just take the camera and we'll film the sugar going in there. It'll be Perfect. excellent. James, thanks Love very much. Post production. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and and just a note to. Uh, that we're still, the sound, we haven't gotten into the, the, the best sound gear yet. Once James has put his, his head on this, it's going to be freaking awesome. At this yeah. point, it's good, but it's going to be freaking awesome once we're all the way there. So. Yeah, believe Thanks. it.